Recently, the committee I installed, consisting of the uh, Vice President of the Council of Advice, Mavis Brooks, uh, Mr. Gaston Bell, uh, the Deputy Governor, Reynold Hrunevelt, Patsy Phillips, and <clears throat> the Honorable Judge, Bob Witt, uh, submitted their report uh, in connection with the feasibility of starting a law school. The establishment of a law school is extremely important to be able to improve the knowledge base of St. Martin and produce crucial skills to support the governmental apparatus and the overall economy of St. Martin. <clears throat> it will also be a source to reduce brain drain and it will offer many a second chance to tertiary uh, education. Of course, to be able to survive in an ever increasing globalized world, we have to invest in human capital. Investment in our people is the best investment we can make to create a firm foundation going forward for our country. Ways still have to be found to finance this investment, and uh, I'm committed to finding sources to make this a reality given its importance, in my view, going forward. Bricks and stones alone is not going to get us there. We need people with the skills and the knowledge to be able to support the foundation that we have. Not so long ago, the chief of the IMF was here, and he explained that they came to the conclusion that the per capita income of St. Martin, based on GDP, is the highest in the entire Caribbean. The GDP per capita income for St. Martin has been established at 26,000 US dollars per year, which is equivalent to about 46,000 guilders per year. To contrast this and to give you uh, a perception as to what this means, if we look at the per capita GDP income of Belize, their annual per capita GDP income is an amount of 4,366 US dollars. If we look at the per capita income of an island that's a little close to us, Barbados, their per capita GDP income is $16,000 for each citizen of their country. Ours is at 26000 when you hear that number, you query and say, but where is it? Is it really so that the majority or all average persons on St. Martin makes $26,000 a year? Then you would say, that doesn't sound believable. Or the $26,000 is not being earned by the masses. It's being earned by others in a multiple factor. It means that 
when you are considered to be a country with a $26,000 per capita income, um, if I take Jamaica, it is $4,909 per year. Countries with a per capita income of that level has access to many international programs where they receive grants, where they receive assistance, in order to develop their country because they are characterized as a low-income country. When you are characterized as we are, as a middle-income country, none of these programs are available to us. We have to fend for ourselves. Now, having said that, um, it will take a lot because it explains, and the Caribbean is known to be, in terms of equality, the area with the highest inequality as far as income is concerned in the whole world. So government has a duty to fine-tune, to try to uh, bring this inequality from which we're suffering in terms of what programs are available to us internationally, to pay keen attention to it from time to time. If I take the Prime Minister of our country and see what he's, he earns and see what he's responsible for, in fact, he's responsible for everything on the island. He's responsible for social development. He's responsible as prime minister for government-owned companies. He's responsible for whatever you can think of. The buck stops with him. Now, what does he make? And if that's what the prime minister makes to be able to uh, carry out all his duties and responsibilities, and we go and look at government-owned companies, the question would arise, can a director in a government-owned company make more than the prime minister of the country? I don't think that that should be the case. And I think that um, government-owned companies will have to, and I'm going to propose that to the Council of Ministers, come with a policy for key positions in government-owned companies to determine what has been paid to directors, to uh, top positions in government-owned companies, and to make sure that the policy they come with, that it has a ceiling and the ceiling has to be that it cannot be higher than what the prime minister makes. There are some government-owned companies that suffer losses. Now, like every football game or basketball game or baseball game, if the head of that team is not performing, you need to get rid of him and get someone else who is going to perform. Government makes an infrastructure available to all of these government-owned companies with the expectation that the persons at the helm will perform to make certain that government gets a reasonable return on investment on the equipment and material government has made available to them to manage that company. If it suffered losses, I cannot square how the company could decide to pay the director huge bonuses. Huge bonuses while the management did not perform. Well, it's time that we take a good look at this and it's time that we set policies to be able to restrict this 
And in so doing, probably we will be able to make a small adjustment in terms of that $26,000 per capita that I talked about in the beginning. I was deceived about the nature of my job. I was abducted and sold. All my documents were confiscated and money was withheld from me. I was isolated and confined to one area. I was forced into prostitution. I was forced to lie to authorities and my family. Now that you know, what will you do? You can help by calling the National Reporting Bureau on Human Trafficking at 542-1553 or send email to natikotip at gmail.com. Human Trafficking and Exploitation. Please report it. This morning, I would like to update everyone on the awarding of the contracts for the district cleaning. The government of St. Martin and its bid to get the island properly cleaned up and to enhance the social livability in the various districts on the island prepared and approved a terms of reference on March 3rd for the district cleaning. Uh, I must say that after uh, lengthy discussions and heated discussions between myself, uh, members of my cabinet and uh, the ministry, uh, an additional amendment was made and the terms of reference was presented to the Council of Ministers and approved on April 5th, 2016. On May the 12th, 2016, the public tender for the two-year contract district cleaning for the 13 parcels was held right in this hall and, uh, of the, and a total of 37 contractors submitted bids for one or more parcels in accordance with the terms of reference. The evaluation process consisted of two evaluation rounds, namely one for the completeness of documentations as is stipulated on page 10 of the terms of reference. And the second evaluation round was the qualifying bids that was then evaluated according to uh, the awarding criteria and scoring system as stipulated on page 11 of the terms of reference. Uh, the first round, all bids in the first round was evaluated according to the completeness of their submitted documents Failure to comply with the requirements means that the bids is disqualified and removed from the evaluation process. The second evaluation round, once the bids was evaluated and qualified according to the completeness of their documentation, the bids was then evaluated according to a predetermined awarding criteria and scoring system as I indicated, that is stipulated on page 11 of the terms of reference. Um, the pointing system was completeness of the tender documents. That was a maximum of, of 20 points. Work ownership in the parcel, that was 15 points. That is if uh, a uh, company came from the, the specific district. Uh, third was a work plan, a maximum of 25 points would be awarded for a complete work plan. And the contract total cost, so the, the cost of, of the works, a total of 40 points would be awarded. That is a maximum of 100 points. As a result of the first evaluation round, a total of 15 companies was disqualified due to the lack of the above mentioned documentation and were removed from the evaluation process. So from the 37 companies, 15 was in the first evaluation round disqualified. So that then we was left with uh, 22 companies. After careful evaluation of the bids for the 13 parcels and reviewing the content of the submitted works, work plans, the evaluation committee conclusion that there is room for misinterpretation concerning the work evaluation of uh, parcel 13 
and the committee advised to withdraw parcel 13 from the current awarding procedure and retender parcel 13. That uh, means that we remained with 12 parcels and of the 12 parcels, 10 companies will be awarded contracts. Based on the outcome of the evaluation, two of the 10 companies will be awarded two parcels. So I, I basically outlined um, the process we went through in evaluating uh, these contracts. I wanted to be as transparent as possible. I know um, there's always rumors and, and, uh, and those probably who was not awarded a contract might scream foul or whatever the case may be, but I made it a priority. That is the reason why it took so long going through um, this process that I wanted it to be done transparent. I want it to be done clear. And the evaluation committee consisted of someone from my cab cabinet, someone from the department, and someone from the staff bureau of the ministry. I had lengthy discussions with them. Um, we went through everything thoroughly. And at the end of the day, the advice that was presented was presented also to the Council of Ministers. We had lengthy discussions as well in the Council of Ministers. And um, I, I feel comfortable with this. And um, yeah, I just wanted to convey that. And um, uh, shortly, the, the 10 companies that I mentioned will be invited to the ministry for a discussion. And um, uh, it's, it's been long overdue. Um, again, the, the intention is to have the island, the different districts, properly cleaned to the satisfaction of um, the, the citizens of this country. So in, in concluding, I just wanted to share that with everyone. And I wanted to be clear that my intention was that this process was done transparent, clear, open and fair to create opportunities for everyone um, to participate in, in this endeavor. I was deceived about the nature of my job. I was threatened with violence. I worked excessive days and hours, and money was withheld from me. My boss has no respect for the labor laws. All my documents were confiscated as I was confined and isolated. Now that you know, what will you do? You can help by calling the National Reporting Bureau on Human Trafficking at 542-1553 or send an email to natikotip at gmail.com. Human Trafficking and Exploitation. Please report it. I have two topics for discussion today. One is regarding the policy for work permits for adult entertainers. Um, due to a memo from the prosecutor's office um, late last year concerns, concerning government's possible role in facilitating human trafficking, a decision was made by the Council of Ministers at that time that the Ministry of Justice and the Ministries of TIOT would develop and present a new policy for commercial sex workers. However, in the interim, the court ruled that the Ministry of VSA was required to accept the um, applications for adult entertainers and to process those within two to three weeks. Based on that ruling, the Ministry of VSA developed in consultation with legal advisors as well as with representatives of the industry an interim policy which was approved by Council of Ministers last week. So this is a policy that will serve until the Ministries of Justice and TIAD have had an opportunity to complete their more permanent solution. So adjustments to the old policy were made in order to prevent any sort of abuse and to ensure that government wasn't facilitating or is not facilitating human trafficking. And there's a couple points I think that would make sense to highlight. Um, for clarity, um, the Ministry of VSA is only allowed to issue work permits. So the only permits that we can sign off on are work permits. Um, two, 
we do not issue permits for sex workers, for prostitutes, right? Because that would create a, an agreement, an employer-employee relationship between the um, company and the, the women to be obligated to perform sexual acts. And obligating someone to perform sexual acts is something that government cannot facilitate. Some other things in the, pol in the policy. Um, the brothel owner is not allowed to provide money or loans to the adult entertainment worker prior to his or her arrival to St. Martin with the aim to develop a financial dependency which will make him or her vulnerable to perform work that he or she does not want to do. Um, as I mentioned, we can only issue work permits and as a result of that, like any, any employment permit, that means that the workers are obligated to pay premiums, social premiums as well as wage tax. The permits that we will be issuing will be permits for dancers or animir meishas, which means that that is the only work that they can be obligated by contract to perform. The adult entertainers cannot and shall not be forced to perform any sexual acts against their own free will. So in other words, they have the ability to decide with their free time what they like to do, but that is between them. It's not something that can be forced upon them. Um, the adult entertainment workers also have the right to terminate their agreement with the club at any time and must be free to leave the establishment at their own free will. Additionally, the adult entertainment workers must remain in possession of their passport and other personal identifications and travel documents during their stay. In other words, these are not items that, be, that can be confiscated by the employer. And there's a number of other points, but I think in terms of highlights in some of the changes in the policy, I think that's very reflective of what's been changed. And all of this is aimed towards protecting the, um, the dancers and Amir Meshas that are coming. And also there's, of course, the same protocols in place regarding health inspections, um, things like that. The other thing I would like to make a, a note, a comment about, is um, the ministry is aware that there is a, um, a flourishing industry outside of the clubs in, in St. Martin as well. In other words, we've been receiving feedback that um, there are women that are working nightclubs and bars and offering services outside of the club atmosphere. And just from a health perspective, there is a concern. Number one, this is an unregulated market, meaning that there's no security. That means that there's a possibility for both clients and for people offering services that there's safety risks. In other words, you're working in an unregulated environment where there's no security. There's also been no health inspection, so the people that you may be contracting with um, have not been through the same um, inspections that women in clubs have been through. So just a word of caution for this industry that's, that seems to be developing outside of the clubs. The second topic I'd like to speak about is about the new hospital. Um, the process of building a new hospital for St. Martin, I think, has reached another important milestone and this is in line with our goal of providing, as Ministry of, of VSA, we are um, working towards providing a high quality medical system that is affordable and easily accessible for the people. And this begins with having a high quality, large um, hospital for the, for the country. Um, so this week, on uh, Monday, July 18th at 2 p.m., we received bids for the development and construction of a new hospital for St. Martin. Um, I would like to offer a thanks to all of the people who've put in so much effort up till this point, it's specifically um, the SETV, SMMC, VSA, of course, the ministry itself, as well as Royal Haskening, who's been contracted as an um, engineering consultant in the process, and KPMG, who's our project leader for the process to date. So this process began with, as we developed the terms of reference, um, there were 12 companies that expressed interest in participating in the construction of the new hospital. And this construction includes not only the actual building, but also includes the architecture, the engineering, the design of the facility, 
as well as the construction, but also the maintenance beyond it. And we think that that's an important part because what that means is whoever actually constructs the hospital, they're the ones who will have to maintain it afterwards. And so therefore, if they go, you know, if the quality isn't up to standards in the end, they're going to have the additional expense to maintain it. So we believe that that entire process makes sense. So as I mentioned, 12 parties expressed interest and through a pre-selection process that was narrowed down to five bidders who were invited to, in the end, to bid for the, for the hospital. Um, and by 2 p.m. on Monday, there were three bids that were received. And those companies are Baum Phillips in partnership, Vamed, and a company, Inso. The final evaluations um, will be hopefully completed by the end of August, according to our timeline. And I'd like to just make a brief note as to why we opened these at the notary. So there were three copies delivered and one original set delivered to the notary. So the notary was responsible for one, verifying that all of the submissions were done according to what was required by the terms of reference. So in other words, verifying that everything was actually received received in a timely manner, so there could be no discrepancies about who submitted on time. And what we're doing is we're leaving the original copy in the hands of the notary. So what it means is that if there's any um, discussions in the future that somehow documents were tampered with, there is an original copy that remains in the hands of the notary, and that is actually the copy that remains legally valid. So if there's ever any sort of discrepancy, we will return to the original copies that have been left at the notary. So I can't think of more that we could do to make the process more open, more transparent than we, than we have done. Um, so again, I'm very optimistic about the process. I'm, I'm confident that um, we are on the right track to delivering the people of St. Martin a high quality, affordable hospital um, on fairly short notice. <laughs>